So good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome you to the ABCDE conference. I would like to welcome both those of you who are in the room right now and those who are joining us online. Um, the name of the conference is easy to remember, ABCDE, and it stands for Annual Bank, Bank Conference on Development Economics. As you probably know, it's organized by Development Economics, which is the research group, the research department of the World Bank. You probably know, uh, you, you probably also know it as DEC. Uh, so the uh, ABCDE conference has a very long tradition. It was launched in 1988 by the chief economist at the time, Stan Fisher, and its stated objective is to increase to increase the knowledge base, not just uh, within the World Bank, but also outside the bank among policy uh, practitioners. So I'm delighted to see among us today many researchers from the World Bank and outside the World Bank, but also many uh, practitioners of development. Uh, this year's conference is special in, uh, uh, in at least three ways, I would say. Um, First of all, uh, this year's conference was organized by Shanta Devarayan, who is sitting here in the front. Um, unfortunately for us, unfortunately for the World Bank, uh, Shanta is retiring at the end of the month. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank Shanta very much, not just for organizing this conference, but also for a very distinguished career in the World Bank for 29 years, I think. Uh, and for his many contributions to knowledge, to research, and to development in general. So, so thank you very much, Shanta. Um, second, uh, this conference also marks the 75th anniversary of the Bretton Woods Institution, so of course, it's no coincidence that the subject, the topic of this conference is multilateralism, past, present, and future. Um, 40, uh, 75 years ago, um, uh, actually around this time of the year, so it was between July 1st and July 22nd, 44 countries met at Bretton Woods in New Hampshire in this, in this very beautiful hotel you see it on the screen in order to discuss ways in which countries could cooperate in order to help countries overcome the devastation of World War II. And needless to say, this cooperation was very successful. Um, countries uh, in Europe managed to reconstruct fairly uh, fast, and as a result, the mandate of many international organizations, including the, the World Bank, shifted towards other objectives. Um, 75 years later, the mandate of international cooperation remains more relevant than ever, even though the original issues have been addressed. Uh, we live in a world that's more interconnected than ever before, whether we are talking about uh, trade issues, uh, trade in the, in the age of global value chains, or climate change, or uh, debt transparency. Uh, most of the issues that national governments are concerned with have spillovers to other countries. And therefore, it's important more than ever to cooperate, to engage in international dialogue. That said, we also live at a time when the multilateral system faces many challenges. Many have questioned its relevance today. Um, what we're going to do in this conference is we're going to take a critical look at the contributions at the history of the multilateral system. Um, we are going to hear from many people. We're going to hear from some of the champions of the system, but we're also going to hear from some of the critics. Uh, we are going to celebrate the great successes, the great accomplishments of this system, um, but we're also going to critically assess the limitations of the system, its potential failures, it, the requests for, um, uh, uh, for reforming the system, and in that spirit, we are also going to discuss its future. So I promise you that it's going to be a, a very interesting, a fascinating conference, and I would, I would encourage you to try to participate in as many sessions as possible. Uh, the third way in which this conference is special this year is that it's also the uh, first conference, the first ABCD conference attended by our new president, uh, David Malpas. Of course, David doesn't need uh, an introduction. 
Some of you may know him as being one of the critics of the multilateral system in the past, but as the saying goes, people vote with their feet, and David's feet are here now. So we are looking forward to his remarks um, on uh, the conference and, uh, and also on, the, on how the multilateral system works today. So thank you very much, and again, I hope you'll, you'll participate in as many sessions as possible. Thank you very much, uh, Penelope, and thanks, uh, everybody, for being here. Uh-oh, I closed someone's computer, so I hope that'll work. Uh, it's a it's great pleasure to be here at the annual bank conference on development economics uh, and to see everyone here and I hope it's a very good uh, day for the conference. I'd like to thank Shanta again for hosting this event, for being back uh, for it and for his uh, uh, his career. We've had the chance to get to know each other uh, in my in my uh, first uh, weeks here at the bank and it's been a pleasure. And also thank you to the entire uh, development economics team who's research provides the intellectual foundation of our work around the world. Uh, strengthening that intellectual foundation is why we're here today. I'm personally very interested in development uh, economics as a field, as an endeavor, uh, and, uh, and as a, a vision of where the world can head. Uh, some of you have heard me talk a little bit about my background in that, but I uh, began an intense interest in development economics in 1972. I traveled to uh, the Soviet Union by 1975, had traveled extensively in Latin America in the, in the uh, 70s, and then ended uh, uh, up with uh, uh, Georgetown in the School of Foreign Service, their mid-career fellows program in the early 80s, and then worked for the, uh, as the international economist for the Senate Budget Committee, which was in, in 1984, 85, 86, which was a thorough review of development economic principles in uh, uh, and AID within the uh, uh, within in those days, the the uh, major spots of of interest were uh, Central America, were South America, the Latin debt crisis, and then uh, Pakistan. Of course, was a, was a continuing interest. Many of those continue today. So I'm enjoying the work at the World Bank on, uh, on issues to try to advance uh, development uh, economics in those fields. Since its launch in 1988, ABCDE has been, in the words of Stanley Fisher, who was, uh, who was, a, 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 it was and is a good friend, the World Bank, he was the World Bank chief economist in 1988, and he made the point that it's a, con it's a key platform for quote, improving both member country and bank policy making by enhancing the knowledge base, end quote. In the last three decades, the world has changed dramatically. Developing economies have become a larger, more systemic part of the global economy. New global issues such as HIV AIDS, the environment and climate change, fragility, conflict, and violence have challenged our knowledge and forced us to rethink old paradigms. Over the years, ABCDE has covered, so this conference has covered global issues ranging from the transition of socialist economies after the collapse of the Soviet Union to big data. So I was at the annual meeting. Uh, I was at the annual meetings of the World Bank Group in uh, 19, starting in 1984. But one of the memorable ones was 1988 uh, in the fall in Berlin, uh, where the the uh, uh, impen for the collapse of the Soviet Union at that time was not envisioned. But people were beginning to think about what the world would be like uh, after the uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union. Big data of course, is a current everyday theme now that people are working on. This year's theme, multilateralism, reminds us that cooperation is at the center of the system established at Bretton Woods Conference 75 years ago. The deliberations at Bretton Woods established a group of institutions, the IMF, uh, the GATT, which uh, I worked on a lot. The pre it was the precursor to WTO, uh, IBRD, and uh, now the World now the World Bank Group. The economic system mapped out 75 years ago 
uh, was based on the principle that there should be no limits to prosperity and that freedom of opportunity is the key to advancing prosperity around the world. The new economic system was also designed to address challenges that individual countries could not tackle on their own. Uh, this system has given us the strongest economic advance in history, and economic research at the World Bank has been an important contributor. At the 1956 World Bank annual meetings, the year I was born, the bank's president, Eugene Black, said that the bank quote, has evolved into a development agency which uses its financial resources as but one means of helping its members. Uh, referring to research, data, analysis, and advisory work uh, th were the bank's other essential tools. Research groups have existed in the World Bank in various forms since the bank was first established. In 1972, research was placed under the strong leadership of the first chief economist, Hollis Chinnery. The first World Bank report was published in 1978 under the title Prospects for growth and alleviation of poverty. This broad topic still echoes today in our mission to e end extreme poverty and advance shared prosperity. The WDR, as you know, this year's uh, theme uh, will be global supply chain. So I, that may be a topic of the conference today as well. Uh, the mission is more urgent than ever. More than 700 people, excuse me, 700 million people still live in extreme poverty, and growth is hindered by persistent problems such as uncontrolled debt. More research, data, and transparency are needed. In the last 10 years, government debt rose substantially in developing countries, up from an average of 36 percent of GDP in 2007 to 51 percent in 2018. The number of low-income countries classified as at risk of debt distress is increasing. At the same time, low interest rates continue in advanced economies. So developing countries face a trade-off. On the one hand, low interest rates make it more attractive to borrow to finance much needed growth. On the other hand, borrowing adds to debt levels, creating macroeconomic risks if growth does not materialize and if investment projects do not generate expected benefits. So this was a primary topic of the, uh, of the G7 and G20 meetings that I just returned from. So in, in uh, Fukuoka, Japan, we had a G7 uh, uh, finance ministers meeting where this topic, transparency, debt, and, uh, max, and finding ways to get growth and investment in developing countries was a, was a long topic of the uh, dinner discussion. And then at the G20 meetings themselves, it was the uh, development finance was the first topic of discussion, which uh, Chela, thinking back, we, we're not sure that's happened uh, so much before that the G20 would tackle development finance right at the beginning of its sessions on sat Saturday morning a week ago. Uh, and I spoke on uh, the importance of connecting uh, the finance to investment, to growth, to poverty alleviation, and, ev and people are receptive to that conversation, but also rec re recognizing the complexity of the issues that are raised by it. Uh, many of you remember the HIPAA initiative and MDRI debt relief initiatives. Uh, 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 after that, many low-income countries found themselves with low debt burdens, which expanded opportunity, their opportunities to borrow on non-concessional terms, especially for private lenders, and expanded their lending by non-traditional sovereign creditors. So I was in Mozambique in uh, April, and they took advantage. They had got, gone through debt relief initiatives and then were able to borrow a lot from private sector markets, that, and it did not work out well at all. So these are practical challenges coming from the development finance side. Policy advice 
to restrict non-concessional debt accumulation has its own risks, such as incentivizing countries to conceal actual debt levels. Debt is hidden directly through misreporting or indirectly through shifting debt off balance sheets and onto state-owned enterprises or loan guarantees for public-private partnerships. We are working closely with the IMF to improve debt transparency. Our policy advice must be anchored in a wider engagement with countries about ref the reforms needed to stimulate broad-based growth and poverty reduction. That policy advice, much like our lending, must be built on solid, a so solid foundation of evidence. The research to provide that evidence is itself a multilateral effort. Uh, f in conclusion, for debt transparency, we need global cooperation to cross-check data sources from official and pr private creditors. We need collaboration to improve the statistical reporting of sovereign debtors. We also need to work together on growth-enhancing reforms and sustainable financing strategies. At the World Bank Group, research shapes every aspect of our approach to development. I want to thank you all for being here. I look forward to hearing the results of your discussions and to finding new ways to apply your work to the urgent challenges we face. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you, David. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to kick off the uh, ABCDE this year uh, with our first of three keynote speakers. Uh, and uh, I will just uh, introduce uh, her to you, and then she will give her talk, and then we might have time for a question and answer uh, session afterwards. So it is a real pleasure and an honor to uh, introduce Nairi Woods. Um, in many ways, Nairi represents all three uh, subtitles of the conference, the past, present, and future uh, of uh, multilateralism. Uh, let me start with the future. Uh, she is currently the founding dean of the Blavatnik School of Government, and for uh, many years before that, she led a, uh, a, a, a program at Oxford University on global economic governance. Uh, many of her writings, actually, in many of her writings, uh, anticipated <laughs> some of the problems that we face. I think around 2000, uh, she uh, edited a, a book uh, called The Globalizers, colon, The World Bank, the IMF, and their borrowers. Um, which basically laid out the, the, the events of the subsequent two, uh, two, two decades. So that was uh, the, uh, and, and I think her talk today uh, will be on the, uh, on the, uh, on the uh, future of uh, multilateralism and particularly the World Bank. On the present, um, in many ways, uh, Nairi not only thinks about and writes about these issues, but she actually does things about them. So she's training the next generation of uh, policymakers in this field at the Blavatnik School, and even before that, with Princeton, ran a, a fascinating program on global leaders uh, on, on global governance. Uh, so she is very much in the in the action as well. But then let me share with you uh, something I thought had to do with the past, uh, because among among Nairi's many awards and honors, uh, there's one um, that has to do with an institution that actually ended around the time of the Bretton Woods uh, Conference in uh, uh, 1944. <laughs> because last year, uh, the Queen of England uh, 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 gave uh, Nairi the award of Commander of the British Empire. Uh, so, 
<laughs> we have none other than the person who embodies both the past, the present, and the future of multilateralism as our opening keynote speaker, Nairi Woods. <laughs> Uh, thank you, I think, uh, Shanta. Um, great. Look, what I wanted to do today is open up a conversation or continue a conversation which I'm sure is going to go across the two days, which is to really step right back and to say what is the World Bank's future in a, in a world which is now becoming so shaped by what I would call the strategic rivalry. And to pose the question sharply, I think the World Bank could become one of three things. It could become a pawn in the strategic rivalry. It could become irrelevant as other institutions play more and more the bank's role in that rivalry. Or the bank could become the forum in which the rivals cooperate. And I'd like to just walk through what that argument looks like and come to some conclusions to kick off a discussion among you. Let me start by just thinking about what it means to say there's a, the strategic rivalry is beginning to shape the shape multilateralism as we know it. It's obvious to everybody in this room that we're seeing an accelerating decline of a multilateral order that became stronger and stronger as the Cold War ended and the United States took on a full kind of hegemonic role. It, it had begun, obviously, with the birth of Bretton Woods, but strengthened in what some people like to call America's unipolar moment. And what that meant was a world in which there was one set of rules and a willingness by the hegemon to uphold those rules and uphold institutions which would uphold those rules. So hegemony is about, as you all know, it's about a great power not just being able, but also being willing to play that role, willing sometimes to sacrifice its short-term interests to secure long-term alliances and long-term cooperation. Under that, under that umbrella, the last two decades in particular have seen the World Bank and others um, play an important role in hastening a liberalization of world economic relations, of financial globalization, the opening up of trade, and integrating countries across the world into that rule-based system. Now, what are we seeing replace that system? What we're seeing, I think, run alongside and eventually replace that system is something very different, and it's what I characterize as the strategic rivalry. Now, people have different definitions. Here's mine, and here's what I'm referring to. For me, there's three elements to the strategic rivalry that we have to focus on. The first is that it's a competition for control of resources and access to resources and markets. So it's a competition for control of those. Second, it's a competition for domination of the technology of our time. So it's a competition very focused between China and the United States, the world's top 20 tech companies, uh, 11 US companies and nine Chinese companies. The world's investment into AI gets pretty much split between China and the United States. As somebody who, who lives in Europe, you know, Europe is once again, in a way, and I'll come back to that, a bystander to a superpower rivalry. And, and thirdly, it's a competition for control of the rules of the game, where the rules are no longer the multilateral rules that we've all become so comfortable operating in and on which so much of our advice to countries is based on, but rather it's a new set of relations in trade, in investment, in immigration, in the international monetary system, where the United States it has gradually, and this, it's not entirely the new administration in Washington, not so new, but President Trump's administration, we already saw a retreat from some of the hegemonic role that the United States played. And where China and the United States, but also other rivals, Russia, 
playing an expanded role internationally, are coming to compete over those three things. So at the moment, the countries that the World Bank is engaged with, both as shareholders on its board and as countries in need of the World Bank's advice and lending, are right in the middle of those two chessboards, where one is the rule-based multilateral system and the other is the emerging strategic rivalry. And what the World Bank does in that space, I think, is really important. As I said, I think it can become a pawn and a relevance or a forum for the rivals to cooperate. But that latter will take some pretty strenuous rethinking about what the World Bank is and how it does its business. Uh, Penelope, in her opening remarks, talked about the history 75 years ago. And let's not forget that when the World Bank was born, it was born to be the lender to Europe so that Europe could reconstruct. And it was almost immediately pushed out of that role by a superpower rivalry, by the onset of the Cold War, which led the United States to realize that if it wanted to secure its geostrategic aims in Europe, it would have to do something that was far more direct and far more political, the Marshall Plan. And the crucible for that decision making was, of course, the post-war conflict in Greece, the elections in Italy, in France, and elsewhere in Europe, which, in which it was feared in the United States that communist governments would be elected to power. So the Marshall Plan became, in a way, the political alternative to the World Bank, and the World Bank instead became a development lender and not the primary engine for reconstruction in Europe, which it was intended to be. I think it's, it's fascinating that today some people call China's Belt and Road Initiative China's Marshall Plan, and it's very interesting that some of the centers that, are, uh, that, that people are seeing as a forum for that rivalry are those same historic ones. So Greece, in the early stage of the Eurozone crisis, then began to look for investment and ended up, of course, if we look at Piraeus port, Europe's third largest port, it's, a chi it's China's Costco that that bought and runs Piraeus port. Likewise, Valencia, Zeebrugge, ports across Europe. Portugal, after in, in the height of its years, privatizing its electricity and gas grid, it's Chinese companies that stepped in and invested and purchased those, what some would call, strategic assets. Just a few weeks ago, Italy signed up to be the first G7 member to become a member of China's Belt and Road Initiative to a frisson of real concern across other G7 members. So once again, we can see Europe at, at the center of, it's not, well, Europeans would all, always like to Im imagine that you know, we're at the center, not at the center, but once again, we can see a rivalry being played out in Europe because of Europe's need for investment, because of China's willingness to invest and its long-term strategic plan for its Belt and Road Initiative, and because of America's stepping back from those multilateral commitments. One of the concerns that I feel very sharply when I come to Washington, D.C., is whether the strategic rivalry can be contained. Already we're seeing that the trade war has consequences for every country that everybody in this room works with and works on. But of course, a strategic rivalry can be far worse than that. It can lead to hot conflicts. And we've lived through this in the world before. So the next point I'd like to address is how do we prevent a strategic rivalry becoming a conflict which would have devastating consequences for countries across the world and, and all the members of the World Bank? And there I think we can learn from the Cold War, and it's worth us looking at this when we're looking at the role that the World Bank might play in the coming decade. Because during the Cold War, 
the possibilities of hot war were always present, but were constrained. And we learned quite a lot as a world about what works and what doesn't. So let's just think about a couple of things. One, the role that formal multilateral treaties and institutions played, mostly in the security sphere. So what was different about the Cold War was, of course, it did not involve two blocks that were economically intertwined, as China and the United States are, but rather it involved two separated blocks, separated economically, but whose fate was intertwined through their security arrangements and their nuclear deterrents. And so, so the institutions in the Cold War had to war work to contain the security threats, not so much the economic ones. So the first dot were the formal treaties, so the ABM Treaty, SALT I, the Accidents at Sea Agreement in 1972, the Berlin Quadripartite Agreement in 1971. Each of these agreements was a multilateral treaty that had behind it an institution that had the information to monitor and report and prevent cheating or free riding. No treaty system ever works perfectly, but I think the Cold War experience was that each of those formal treaties played an important moderating effect. And I'll come back to that because I think this is something that the World Bank can learn from in moderating the economic hot conflicts that can emerge in the strategic rivalry. A second approach was not so much the broad agreements. You'll, you'll recall the historians among you that Nixon and Brezhnev signed a basic principles accord in 1972, which, which did very little. But instead, we might look at what actually worked, which was the very specific agreements that created neutral spaces. So think about the multilateral treaty, the Austrian straight state treaty, which was um, the superpowers agreeing on Austria's neutrality in a multilateral treaty because, of course, other countries had to be part of that arrangement. That notion of neutrality I want us to come back to in thinking about the role of the World Bank. And then, of course, there were informal agreements which proved very important and for which the World Bank needs extremely good brokers. So think about the Soviet-American agreement when um, when the Soviets backed the, the intervention to push the Somalis out of Ogaden, there was a real risk that the, Somalis would, would, that the Soviets would then continue through into Somalia. And it was an informal, well, it was, a, it was a formal agreement, but not a treaty between the Soviet Union and the United States that prevented that, just to, to give you an example. So formal treaties, specific agreements around neutrality, and a forum to negotiate on specific conflicts, some rules of restraint. In every case, these were contested. They didn't always last decades, but these were very important moments of restraint. And I think that this spells something important for the World Bank. It tells us that in a world of strategic rivalry, we will always need safe places for rivals to actually talk to one another. When I say safe, I mean trusted by both sides as a place that they can be convened and speak. Institutions which can provide information to them so that instead of working on misperceptions which aggravate and accelerate a crisis, can find grounds for mutual interest and help countries form agreements, at least of uh, to, to mitigate Knowledge, knowledge about how best to achieve their respective goals, which of course this institution excels at. And then the monitoring and reporting that helps parties hold to an agreement and permits them not always to assume that the other side is cheating. As I said, the Cold War was about security. This strategic rivalry is about has a huge economic dimension, where the United States and China are hugely intertangled. I don't think that the lesson that we should take from that entanglement, that interdependence, is that war is not possible. That was the foolish error made before the First World War about Germany and Britain. 
that they were so economically interdependent that war would be too costly to risk. So that, that's not the argument that I'm making. It's to say that the economic interdependence means that we need some of these security containment policies operating in the economic realm to keep the conflict and the rivalry within bounds. So in conclusion, what I think the role that the World Bank can and should be thinking about playing, that the membership of the World Bank should think about the World Bank playing, has three components. And the first is to be a forum for cooperation between, or if there's more than two, among the strategic rivals. And we know the issues, pandemics, climate change, the containment of conflict and fragility, which risks spilling over to the detriment of all parties' mutual interests. And that, to me, is a first role that the World Bank could think about playing, but for which you would need some quite significant reforms to the World Bank if it wanted to play that role, and I'll come to those in my final remark. A second role for the World Bank in this strategic rivalry is lending to support regions, not just individual countries, but regions, and sometimes using the World Bank's lending and good offices to secure neutrality for those countries. The strategic rivalry will mean, and already is meaning, that countries all over the world are having to choose. Do they go with the United States or do they go with China? What will be the reverberations if they go one way or the other? Can they have Huawei and Google within their borders at the same time? And I think what the World Bank's borrowers will need is support, regional support, so they can stand collectively together in regions, and sometimes some neutral space in which to make those decisions. And the third role, I think, for the World Bank is around technology. The fact that the world's 20 tech giants are all Chinese and American, and that the effects of scale for those tech giants are exponentially increasing, because the oil of the, tech, of, of the tech economy is data. It's the more data you have, the more it can inform your algorithms, the more you can use AI. And that winning race makes data, in my view, as others have said, the new oil of the global economy. So for the World Bank's borrowers, the question is surely, are the new tech companies the oil giants of the 1960s? And what did we learn about the relationship between those oil majors and developing countries? What did we learn about what is required for developing countries to strike a fair deal for their oil in face of those oil giants? What will it mean for each of the developing countries to strike a fair deal with the tech giants who are coming in thirsty search of data from them? In the United States, in this city, there's a big debate about how the United States itself might regulate Facebook or Google or Amazon. Imagine if you're Mali on your own, what then? What is the deal you strike and with whose support? And I think there the World Bank, because it's got the relationships in those countries, because it's got a capacity to really ramp up its analysis of that, then it stands, it, it stands ready to help those countries. And let's not forget that this is not, this is for countries increasingly a life or death issue. It's not just an economic issue. Technology provides an enormous opportunity for developing countries. And in the Blavatnik School, we have the, the Pathways for Prosperity Commission, which is really harvesting the lessons about how developing countries can use technology to leapfrog in health, in education, in, eco in, in a new economy. But I think the global issue is this issue of data, of data governance, of fair deals, and, and, and how it is that developing countries can be part of rule setting in that domain. 
So those are three of the roles that I think the World Bank could be playing in this strategic rival. Let me finish these um, first remarks by saying what is it that the World Bank would have to be if it wanted to play those roles? And the first is that as pretty much, you know, it was really interesting, you know, preparing for today and reading through the, you know, some excellent work by the independent evaluation group of the bank, as well as a lot of work that's been done within the bank, which keeps rehearsing the constraint of the one country loan, the World Bank's main instrument. And of course, competitively, the World Bank is now facing many other organizations that can do the one country loan. So that as a USP, it never was a p p purely unique to the World Bank, but it's become much less of an advantage to the World Bank. And it's preventing the World Bank from doing the kind of regional um, loans and sometimes global initiatives that would permit the World Bank to play the roles that I've just described. So that's the first. It's what should the new instruments of the World Bank look like and what would it re require for the World Bank to define and take those forward. The second is for the bank to really focus on what its unique value added is now. I've made the argument over the last decade that if we take the World Bank's IDA loans and we take the bilateral aid system, it seems to me that the World Bank has not stepped up to playing a unique role in the global aid system. And my, my point there is to say that the aid system of bilateral donors is one that's full of bilateral darlings, donor darlings and donor orphans. That we know the caprices, the national politics, the national fashions that dictate where bilateral aid goes. A unique value added to the World Bank would be to countervail that system. But if you look at the World Bank's record on IDA loaning, lending, it has pretty much um, moved exactly with those bilateral donors, amplifying the donor darling and donor orphan problem. So I give this example not, not as a criticism looking back, but as a challenge to say, that right up close, the World Bank's constantly being asked by its members to compete on the s in the same terms as them, to give loans where they're giving loans. But actually, for the World Bank's long-term strategic position in the multilateral system, it needs to have a much clearer view from within the bank of what it can do that none of those bilateral donors can do and what it would take for it to step up and play that role. And that kind of thinking is going to be even more important in the strategic rivalry, like rivalry where the bank is going to continually be pushed and pulled more as a pawn than as a forum for cooperation between the superpowers. And finally, the governance of the bank um, is going to need rethinking. If we go back again to the 75 years, this institution was born with some very clever lessons about how you engender trust in a country that's a reluctant, in a superpower that's a reluctant member. The United States came out of the Second World War wanting to eschew entangling relations, wanting not to be drawn into a multilateral system of constraint. And so the founders of the World Bank constructed a system which would give trust to that reluctant superpower. Hence these headquarters in Washington DC, hence the voting power structure of the governance, hence the working language of the World Bank and keeping it out of the UN quota system, hence the presidency and the selection of the president of the World Bank so these issues of leadership selection, of headquarters, of voting power, we can learn from that are really important ways to ensure trust in the institution. 
In my view, if the bank wants to be a place of cooperation between the two strategic rivals, it has to come back to those four elements and think about how best to deploy the four in order to engage both strategic rivals so that their competition with one another doesn't eviscerate and destroy the work that the world's bank the work the world bank has done across the developing world over the last 75 years thank you Wow, thanks so much, Nari. Uh, this is uh, <laughs> an amazing amount of fresh thinking and new ideas. I wish, our, I wish more of our senior management was here <laughs> uh, to hear it, uh, but they will. <laughs> um, and uh, also, also very inspiring. I mean, I think you've created a sense of urgency uh, among us, and I think that's what we're looking for. So let's... Um, I, and, there are some issues that you raise that uh, require further discussion. So let's uh, open it up now. Uh, why don't you, uh, the, uh, the only requirement is you have to come to one of the two mics because this is being live streamed or recorded or whatever uh, for uh, questions. And we have, uh, we have half an hour, right? Uh, uh, so we can actually have a, have a discussion. Go ahead and please identify yourself uh, uh, thank you very much. My name is Manzoor Rahman, and I've been a senior transport specialist of the bank uh, uh, in my career here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Neri, especially you. You raised, uh, like uh, Shanta said, you know, uh, uh, enormous amounts of uh, very relevant things uh, and which are really very close to everybody's mind and heart uh, uh, these days. And I think uh, the, the way I was uh, thinking, I think you, you mentioned that the strategic rivalry can be very uh, dangerous and, and can lead to conflicts. And then the, you know what works and what doesn't work. But uh, you know, the way we see these days, the, and you mentioned also the, 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 the US role and the, these uh, G7 countries role. But you know, the way we see it these days, uh, what is happening, the degradation, uh, continuous degradation of those institutions which were set up after the World War uh, II, you know, the, the United Nations and, and, and similar others. And I think there is no voice that is being raised, you know, by, by everybody, you know, because of this um, uh, politically correct uh, notion or, you know, that, that thing. Every, you know, nobody raises it, and and I don't know how to, uh, that that we can do. We are helpless, uh, like spectators. But uh, very soon we are, uh, we are directly affected. Uh, you know, but I think the, the 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 things, for example, what happened. You know, the, the the we have seen now the wars. Now now everybody's mind is now the third big war is is looming. You know, somewhere. And, and, and our climate change uh, uh, battle is another, you know, which is on us now. So what I'm trying to say that the question is that, you know, how to uh, raise this multilateralism, can, can it help or, or no? For example, what is happening in the Strait of Hormuz now, you know? Uh, and, 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 you know, one party is just kind of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, enforcing or actually uh, forcing down the throats of others. So, I mean, uh, and, and I'm saying the, the, in two days, the, the prices of gas uh, went up and it comes down to us right away, you know? So I'm saying it's not that we are just uh, in our, our spectators and uh, the, yeah, these we, people, China, I think we got Russia. the question. <laughs> okay, so, thank you. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Um, let's get uh, t uh, two more. Yeah, go ahead, please. Thank you for your very rich uh, intervention. My name is Ransom Lekunze. I am actually a professor at the Copenhagen Business School. Uh, when I was about to come for, to this conference, my students did ask me, why go there? What new are you going to bring from this kind of a meeting? It's just to tell you that the World Bank and most of these Britain Woods institutions whatsoever are actually losing their morale and actually losing their worth. And even the young students are picking it up very, very much. So you have actually been able to address some of these issues very, very squarely. But my real concern is where is the political will 
for the leaders of the World Bank to be able to move away from bilateralism into multilateralism. Because bilateralism is actually, has been the instrument that they have used in the past to be able to control their strategic alliances and also to be able to control, have uh, control over resources around the world. And you also talked about the one country loan, which has been something that the World Bank has cherished so much in the past. What new can actually be done to be able to move these institutions from their bilateralism, bilateral ties to multilateral ties? Something must be done. And I didn't get the answer from you, and I don't know if the audience has answers to this, or if there is any political will to get that done. If I can get that answer, I'll bring it back to my students. Thank you. Thank you very much for fascinating speech. And uh, I'm Hideki Matsunaga from Chief Economist Office of MENA, Middle East and North Africa. And I have a question to Shanta and maybe Professor Woods. And uh, I think what you have laid out about the role of the World Bank, the three points, as well as uh, what we are, uh, those are pretty, I think, are relevant. In that connection, I have a question. Is a second point of the role, which is a lending regional. It's, I think, first point is more like a how we're going to meet global public goods. And second one is a more like regional public goods. And you also pointed out we need uh, new instruments. But uh, I feel the second point, how are we going to meet regional public goods lending? Because we are totally based on the nation state lending, sovereign lending. And uh, I, I think uh, if you're a borrower, you're not going to borrow to the next door neighbor. And I think that's really very most difficult part, and if Shanta or Professor Wood, if you have any idea about this, you could elaborate any hints on this instrument, much appreciated. Thank you. Okay, that's a good, that's a rich, let me add a, a footnote to Ransom's question um, about political will, uh, and it relates to your point about, uh, say, IDA uh, f financing countries that the bilaterals are not financing uh, is that they still have to sell this to their taxpayers and their voters back in the countries. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the dilemma, because the bilaterals will go and sell their donor darling. They'll say, oh, Rwanda is a great success story. We're putting a lot of money in. And at the same time, they say, oh, by the way, we're telling Ida, which is also paid for by your tax dollars, uh, not to put money into Rwanda, but to put money into, I don't know, Malawi or, or some other place that nobody is actually financing. So how do you manage that, th that uh, uh, tension? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's always, um, there is always a tension just on, on that, Shanta, although Although in most large organizations, people are too risk averse on that. They always ask for permission when actually they could push, they could push the envelope. So that's, that's one part of my answer. Um, and you know, the other would be that um, um, you know, may, maybe the World Bank in its governance reforms needs to move to a similar, although not yet completed, governance compact as the AIIB have moved towards, which is to delegate loans to the senior management and then to oversee them more. Because a board that micromanages the lending of the organization does two things which I think are, are not good for this institution. And one is it diffuses responsibility who is really responsible for deciding a loan? Is it the president and staff of the organization? Or is it the diffuse members of the board who are each looking the other way in order to protect their own, their own loans? Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's poor governance to have the board micromanaging loans. And if, if you were to delegate lending to the senior management and then ensure that the board does what the board should do, which is robust annual oversight, of the overall strategic direction of the bank, then maybe that's one way that you'd get there. Um, Mansoor asked about the degradation of multilateral institutions. Um, and Mansoor, I guess my, 
my answer would begin with the economic institutions, the bank, the fund, and other, and the G7, the G20, who for the last 20 years have every meeting of the G7 and G20 has had a, a strap line which is something about managing globalization better or making globalization inclusive. In other words, since 1997, since the East Asian financial crisis, there's been a recognition that globalization is producing some pretty sharp winners and losers. And there's been a constant pledge by leaders to do something about that. But how well did they actually do? If we look at the McKinsey Global Institute report on inequality published two years ago, they asked the question, what percentage of households in a group of Western industrialized countries saw their revenue from both capital and income stagnate or decline in the period after the financial crisis, so from 20, no, from 2005 through to 2013 or 14. The result is staggering. The figure for the United Kingdom is 70%. That's 70% of households in the country seeing their household revenue stagnate or decline. For the United States, it's 81%. For Italy, it's 97%. Why are we surprised that in each of those three countries there's been a political revolution against the status quo if the majority of people were not benefiting from the status quo? People then say to me, oh, but that's technology and globalization. It's having that effect everywhere in the world. Not true. The figure for Sweden is only 20%. What that tells me is that it's a question of public policy. It's a question of the policies being adopted by government on tax, on labor force, on interest rates, on, in all kinds of domains which are leading to these distributive consequences. And that's the political revolution that is leading governments to follow, to, leading governments to be tossed out and leading incoming governments to say, we don't want this multilateral system. Now, they bring to bear all kinds of arguments as to why you can hate multilaterals. There always have been a lot of arguments. But what I would say to multilaterals is that instead of continuing to say, you must support the multilateral system. These are terrible populists, you know, evil people that want to. Instead, the multilaterals, the people working in the multilaterals, and those of us in academia working on these issues, need to rise to that challenge and say, what is it that needs to be done to ensure that in the next decade, 80% of households are not seeing their revenue decline? What is that? project look like and what are the global agreements we need to make that project possible. So I think that's the challenge for multilaterals. Um, and then there was uh, the question about the political will of leaders, which I've strayed into there. How do we get the members of the World Bank, Ransom asked, to agree to a new role? for the World Bank? Well, the first is to come up with the ideas and to focus those ideas on the issues that the major members of the bank really need help solving. Because they do. If you look, take the biotech issue, both China and the United States have an issue of how you control biogenetic uh, genetic engineering. Both have shown they're concerned about that. The Ebola crisis or pandemics, both have a shared interest in controls on this. That's why on infectious diseases, there's been international cooperation for over 100 years. So find those issues and find issue by issue. I certainly wouldn't start with a root and branch structure that could then address individual issues. I would start with the individual issues and build modalities to deal with those issues, and when they succeed, expand them to deal with other issues. And I think the bank can do that. Shant, I'm going to let you talk about regional lending instruments. Oh, okay. 
<laughs> Fair enough. Uh, well, I think it, it really it goes back to something that uh, Naira said earlier, uh, which is that as long as you have a country-based model, we have country directors, we have our shareholders are rep representing groups, uh, you know, some of them individual countries, sometimes groups of countries. As, as long as we do that, I think the regional public good agenda is always going to be shortchanged. Uh, so we really have to shift that around. And, I, you know, I've always thought we should just stop having country directors. Uh, I know there's some in the room here. So they, no, but, but not, not get rid of them, but actually have regional directors. There's no reason why we need to have a country director for, I mean, I, I remember when we were together in, in MENA, I always thought, why do we have a, a, a country director who's in charge of Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and Iran? Why not have a country director for the Mashrek? Those, you know, the people in that region actually don't even know which country they're living in. They're refugees going in and out of all, all over the place. Uh, we're trying to support them. Um, why do we still have to work through individual governments? We should just have, we have a strategy for the Mashrek. We have a, 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 a program there. When we, we lend, we don't really pay attention to which country we're lending in. We're trying to solve problems in those countries. Okay. Uh, yeah. Good. Can I debate that slightly mm -hmm. with you, Shanta? Because I think the, you're absolutely right that that would be the rational solution. But politics in the world is going in exactly the opposite direction. People are becoming less and less trustful of political arrangements and governance arrangements which are distant from them. And I do think we have to marry those two things. So actually, I would keep country directors, but make them be much more active links from the World Bank to countries, not micromanaging the loan pr approval process in Washington, but being the real link, the communicating link, the feedback loop from country to the bank. <laughs> now, this is get, turning into a good debate. <laughs> That's fine, that would be a way to do it, but then we are stuck with another problem. And I'll g give you the example of, of India, um, the, you know, uh, the, where we have a country director, we have a country strategy for India. And the country strategy for India, I mean, India is a large country, right? Um, has, you know, very nice three, four points saying, you know, we're gonna work towards generating growth, inclusive growth, and improving uh, the administrative structures of India, and, and so on. And then, like, number five of those is, oh, and also we're gonna try to make India a more responsible member of the international community uh, on climate change. No real explicit acknowledgement that there's a trade-off between numbers one and four and number five, right? And the question really is, when you're the country director for India, which are you going to focus on? I am sure that item number five is going to be the last thing on that, on that agenda. Uh, and we'll still be having this conversation a year from now. So that's why I, I really, you know, what I'd like to be able to tell the country director, I have tried telling him, of course he doesn't listen to me, uh, uh, is, look, your job is to make India a responsible member of the international community because climate change is the biggest threat we're facing and India is one of the biggest contributors to uh, g uh, greenhouse gases, uh, right? Uh, th there, are enough in there are enough incentives in the system for India to do all the other things well like growth and uh, administrative reform and everything else. The one thing that's lacking, and this comes back to your point about the, the thing that bilaterals aren't doing and the things that individual countries aren't doing are these global public goods. And that's our job, is to try to, to manufacture that, to, to maximize that. Hello. Um, I'm going to first say that I like your discussion on uh, strategic rivalry. Um, and I want to point out this aspect of multilateralism that Sorry, can you identify yourself, please? <laughs> Just. My name is Chantal Iribagiza, and I'm from Rwanda. So huh? thank you for mentioning Rwanda. <laughs> um, 
Um, I'm a PhD student at CU Boulder, um, and I'm working at the bank for the summer. So I want to point out one aspect of multi-radialism that strengthens strategic rivalries or that gives way to them. Um, and I want to hear your thoughts on what can be done on that. So as long as in multilateral organi organizations, not everybody has the same uh, say, not the same um, place at the table, as long as there's China and the U.S. that have such a big say in what happens and in decision making and um, in who decides what gets done, then all these other people who do not have the same say are going to look at them and be like, who can I align myself with to like get my voice heard, to like get my ideas at the table? Um, and this is a, an issue with all, like any multilateral organization that you can think of. Not everybody has their, has the same seat at the table. Um, and I want to like hear what you think can be done about that issue uh, towards addressing strategic rivalry issues. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Thank you for your speech earlier. Um, my, my name is Regina, and I'm coming to you as someone who has had to engage directly with the strategic rivalry between US and China at the Asian Development Bank. So you mentioned two very interesting reforms, the bank to focus on its unique value added role, as well as trying to engender trust in reluctant superpower members. So I wanted to ask, how do you envision the application of these two reforms in something that moves away from strategic rivalry to strategic collaboration, not just with the World Bank, but with other multilateral development banks, including the Asian Development Bank, the African Development Bank, the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank, but also factoring in other players in this large system, such as CSO, civil society organizations, academe, and government. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Vivian Faust. I'm a chief economist for the infrastructure vice presidency here at the bank. Uh, thank you for this very potent wake up call. Um, I was interested to hear that you really placed uh, technology at the center as one of the key forums where this strategic rivalry is being played out. And you also identified technology as one of the three strategic priorities for the World Bank going forward. Can you give us a bit more of a sense of the role you think the World Bank can play in helping countries on data governance issues uh, and how we can organize ourselves to do that effectively? Because a lot of the public debate really is leaving, I think, the developing country perspective behind. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, Professor. Uh, thanks very much for your very enlightening speech. Uh, I actually have a couple of questions, but I'll keep it brief. The first one is about, oh, sorry, this is uh, Ye Yu from the Shanghai Institutes for International Studies. Uh, the, the first is about that you uh, identified three scenarios for the uh, strategic revivals in the uh, World Bank and other multilateral uh, air arenas. I think WTO is typically marginalized, getting irrelevant on this side. What do you uh, see the status of the World Bank now? So uh, you, you, you didn't comment on that. And uh, secondly, you also elaborate a lot about the relationship between the bilateral initiatives and the uh, multilateral ones, especially the Marshall Plan and the World Bank in the early stage. And also you commented on the uh, relationship between the bilateral aid and the rule of the World Bank, which is very uh, enlightening. So there's a lot of discussion about the Belt and Road Initiative and, and the MDBs, not only the World Bank. Actually, the, the, the United States is very, very uh, vigilant about Chinese uh, trying to multilateralize the, the, the BRI. So what do, you, what do you suggest? What should be the, the scenario for the, the future of the two? Should the World Bank enhance it or just uh, to step away from that. So, uh, and the, the Chinese uh, Ministry of Finance has trying to actually to collaborate with MDBs. Uh, and the third one, just very brief, how do you see the role of the World Bank in the future? Should it be more like a bank or more like a development 
institution rather than a bank. Thank you. If I may. Okay. Um, Sharda Srinivasan, um, I am a researcher from the University of Pennsylvania. I work on social and economic effects of internet connectivity around the world. My question also ties to data governance. Uh, in specific, the question that I have is private investments, especially in low and middle income countries, have led to a lot of connectivity by technology-based giants. For instance, Google in Liberia, Facebook in Uganda, are like spending a lot on infrastructure that in the past have been the 40 of multilateral development institutions, such as the World Bank. This causes more negotiations to occur at the national level with respect to data governance. I wanted to ask what your thoughts were, and do you feel like it, there is a tension between trying to get more access within countries by technological giants and the role of the bank in negotiating the policy around technology giants in these countries, especially given that one of the things that the bank tries to do or has tried to do in the past is to create an environment for flourishing private investment. Okay, let's tackle those. Great. Uh, good. So the first one, Shenta from Rwanda. Um, what do you do if you're a small country in the system and the, and the large powers have the largest vote? Do you bandwagon with them? Do you jump into one camp or the other, hoping that they'll represent you? Or the alternative is to balance against them. And it's quite... You know, it's true that the United States is the one country in this institution that has a veto over all decisions requiring a special majority, but it's also the case that groupings of other directors also have a veto if they come together. So there is, there is always that choice, um, and I'll just put that on the table. Um, Regina asked about strategic collaboration with other organizations. Um, I think that's really important. I think understanding that, um, that China is seeking solutions to development issues just as other World Bank members are. We saw it even years ago with the, with the Three Gorges Dam project and China coming to the bank for advice on the resettlement of people, knowing that the bank had been collecting practice in that issue. Now with the Belt and Road Initiative, it seems to me that the Chinese government's intensely aware that it needs to learn to build stakeholder relationships in country, that it's very sensitive to the backlash and to the negative blowback it's getting in some of its major Belt and Road uh, partners, and that it's looking to learn and to collaborate with others in building those, those partnerships. And so there's, there's space to be doing, as, as I think it's Regina said, uh, strategic collaboration. On, on data governance, about which Shanta also um, would have something to say, I think that what the World Bank needs to do is to really think about advice. For example, open data archi architecture. It's to think about what are the components of an ecosystem which permit um, a community or a country to really have a tech sector that, fl that flourishes. And to be much more aware than I think the bank was historically about the perils of large companies having a monopoly position in small countries. And not just saying, as the bank did historically, look, any investment is good investment. We want foreign direct investment in this country to flourish. But to pay a little bit more attention to what happens when that company or investor, which might not have monopoly power in its home country, nevertheless acquires a complete mo monopoly position in that country. Um, so the last question also addressed that issue, talking about um, the way Google and Facebook have spent on infrastructure. Um, or we can think about Chinese companies, CloudWatch's deal in Zimbabwe to provide facial recognition um, a, a facial recognition system to the Zimbabwean government, which for, for um, CloudWatch is a huge source of much more diverse data than they can collect and use in China. So there's huge advantages to that. Google and Facebook have already been mentioned. So 
I think there's, there's a couple of issues that arise for developing countries, and one is to really think through um, what that's doing to the technology ecosystem in country and what it's doing to the political ecosystem. So the deal that Facebook has done in a country like the Philippines, where the trade is that you get free data just for using Facebook, which means that your news only comes to you through Facebook, and you cannot triangulate it even if you want to across the rest of the web because you don't have access to the rest of the web. And where Facebook still today in so many countries, obviously it's been much in the news for what it's done in Myanmar, but, but because it has not taken responsibility for what it is publishing, and I use the word publishing advisedly, because it's using algorithms to curate and pump out posts, in my view that is an act of publishing, and it's caused huge human suffering, death, violence within communities across some of the poorest countries of the world as a result. So the bank's role, I think, is on the positive side to really think about what the components of a, of a good ecosystem are and to give governments advice on what, for example, an open data architecture would look like and not to make these short-term trades which give country, which give certain companies monopoly rights over the data and rather to do much more judicious, strategic, long-term decisions about, about uh, creating a system that will enable the tech sector to flourish. But Chanda, did you, did you want to come in on that issue? Me, yeah, let me just add, j only because I just spent last week, because I'm a member of the Pathways for Prosperity mm -hmm. Commission in Seattle, discussing these very issues. Um, and in particular, and that's why Vivian's question uh, triggered in my mind something that the World Bank could do. I mean, one of our discussions is really what type of regulatory framework African countries should adopt at this point. I mean, if you look crudely put, there's a, there are two extremes. There's the United States and Europe. Uh, one is very relaxed and the other is very rigid. And it's probably the case that neither of those is the appropriate one for a small African country like, like Mali. Then the question is, even if the, we can design a appropriate regulatory uh, uh, system uh, f uh, for managing data, um, uh, and, and in particular this relationship between adopting technology and then providing data for free to the, those technologies. Um, the, the, the question is we may not even have a choice because deals are being made now bilaterally uh, by Chinese companies and sometimes by American companies that actually prejudge what that relationship is going to be. So it would be very difficult once the investment has been made, and particularly with 5G, uh, that it would be very difficult to roll that back once it's, it's, it's done. So the question we, we debated, and I think there is a possibility, is that at least for Africa, we should take an a Africa-wide stance. Our, a, individual African countries are too small to be able to negotiate some of these with, with some of the behemoth uh, uh, technology companies. But if you take the continent of Africa, uh, including North Africa as one one entity, that's as big as India, um, uh, both in terms of GDP and in terms of uh, population. And uh, India is actually managing it in its own in its own way. Uh, but then, if you can get uh, uh, the continent of Africa, and that is something I think a service that the World Bank can help uh, uh, bring about, which is that coalition across Africa uh, to be able to better negotiate. Uh, the kind of regulatory arrangement that then would would be available for uh, foreign investors uh, in 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 Africa, and I would go one step further. I mean, we we discuss the Commission gets quite excited about these things, so we go even further, and maybe there could be a coalition between Africa and India as two you know relatively democratic societies. Uh, that could then uh, 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 bond together uh, against some of these uh, other less democratic entities. And then Ian um, finished the questions with three quick uh, questions. Um, so the first that was about the trade system and the World Trade Organization and perhaps the World Bank's role. Um, it's tempting for the bank to jump in and say, let's be the, the, you know, the last man or woman standing um, upholding um, free trade. But, but the bank actually 
does not have the mandate or power to create, to adjudicate, or to enforce global trade rules. And I think it, it needs to look at what powers it does have, but also be cognizant, as I said, of the political context and what it is that populations, even in the traditional trade liberalizing countries that have pushed the World Bank or um, supported the World Bank, why it is that the politics there have changed and what it is that, that the, the bank's research can tell us about that. The second on the United States trying to stop multilateralism um, in the BRI. Um, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative now has 129 countries belonging to it. Um, it's a bit like trying to stop the AIIB. Um, it might be a forlorn goal. I think it's quite hard for a country that's been in a position of hegemony to understand the limits or the loss of certain powers that came with that. I mean, Shanta so kindly mentioned the British Empire in his introduction to me. The British Empire was disbanded some decades ago, and yet there are some in Britain who still believe that if they can succeed with Brexit, then Britain can kind of resume its imperial role and lead the world into a new free trade order, which is just proof that some, you know, sometimes it takes 100 years to realize that the world has changed. And I think the, the, there's an overestimation, perhaps, of what you can contain. My own view is the most important element that we need to put our minds to is how you contain the strategic rivalry to just a rivalry. The historical evidence is really clear that there are danger signs. And the danger signs to look out for are when you start demonizing the other side and portraying them as an enemy. It's when you develop a national narrative that says that the other side have wronged you. That these are narratives which can create a domestic political force that pushes leaders beyond where they intended to go. And that is definitely where we do not want the world to end up. The alternative, as Angela Merkel keeps putting, there's only one alternative, and it's not an alternative. War is not an option between uh, the superpowers. There's, there's too many, I think, today who are saying, oh, well, it's inevitable. The only option should be cooperation, collaboration, discussion, containment of a rivalry that doesn't have to go to war. And then finally, the, the bank, as a bank or as an ideas institution, I've always felt that um, across the bank's history, the bank has had heady decades of huge lending when it becomes extremely powerful, typically when private capital dries up, when countries are in deep need and they queue outside the bank doors for loans. And in those moments, the bank is very confident of its importance as a lending institution. And then it moves into a subsequent decade where actually there are lots of people lending to those very same countries and the lending portfolio goes down and then everybody in the bank says, yes, but we're a knowledge bank, we're an ideas bank, perhaps because the alternative is on the wane. Um, you know, I, I, I sit and work in a university. There are lots of ideas institutions in the world. The bank does produce important information, knowledge, and ideas. But I, I, I don't think that that's its unique value added. I think it's important, the work that the bank does in that domain. But I think if you take away all the bank's other functions, its lending, its guarantor, you know, its guarantor function, its function as a multilateral institution in which countries can come together even on issues not originally intended in the bank's articles like pandemics or climate change and cooperate, then that strikes me as much more special to the World Bank than the pure kind of ideas and evidence um, collection. Okay, well, that's a nice way to uh, conclude this discussion. Let me thank uh, Nairi for a terrific uh, uh, plenary uh, talk and 
really inspiring us and uh, urging us to uh, think uh, out of the box. I think there's a rich agenda ahead of us, uh, but all of us are going to be working on. And uh, the, let's uh, break for coffee now, I think, and then uh, resume uh, at 11 o'clock with the parallel session. So join me in thanking Naira Wood. Thank you.